to last. Work for the night is coming. Work through the morning hours. Work while the dew is sparkling. Work mid spring. Sunset skies while their bright tints are glowing. Work for daylight flies. Work till the last beam fadeth, fadeth to shine no more. Work while the night is darkening when man's work is. Let's open up in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we want to come before you and thank you for the opportunity that we've had to have uh, these meetings. Lord, we want to thank you uh, for the availability of the missionaries. Father, for, for all those who have showed up tonight, Lord, we ask that you would be with us. Help us to have a good, uh, good night in you. Bring honor and glory to your name. Father, help us to have open hearts and be good soil that will allow the, the, the word to grow in us. We thank you for how you'll answer these prayers. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Again, remind you of our theme verse for the week. It's John chapter 17, verses 18, 19, 20, 21. And some really appropriate verses right there that actually explain to us the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. As thou hast sent me into the world, Jesus praying to his Father, even so have I also sent them into the world. So that is the commission. And then he says, for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. I always found that very, very profound verse. The Lord Jesus, who is, in fact, God, come in the flesh. Amen. He is the Lord of glory. And he says, I sanctify myself. You know, thinking about that just blows my mind that although he was God, sanctified anyway, As a man, he sanctified himself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. The power of missions is through that sanctification of that minister, the one that is is a holy man of God, moved by the Spirit of God through prayer and through the power of God. And we see that right there. And Jesus says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. And that's you and I. We have been saved by the grace of God Uh, over the years. So many millions and millions have been saved as a result of that prayer right there. Those who've gone before us, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. What a beautiful picture that is of the body of Christ, what God is trying to do, expanding his kingdom and winning others to the to the uh, saving grace of Jesus Christ. And so that's what we're here for. We've been doing this for a long time. This is our 29th year of our missions conference. Even before I became pastor 29 years ago, the church was having missions and emphasizing missions. But we've been doing this here for 29 years, sending missionaries, starting churches, and sending them all around the world. And thank God for that. And I thank you for that. Some of you have been here that long, and you've seen God do mighty works, but we're not done. We're not done. Jesus still is is on his way, and we want to be faithful to work for the night is coming and continue on until Jesus comes again or until we are uh, under the ground, amen, and uh, we just keep working. There's no retirement for us. We just keep on working for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I also want to remind you that we are collecting the missions giving support cards. We have a few more back there. Uh, we need you to do this. We need you to do it. For our missions to continue, we have to have people that will give faithfully and sacrificially. We're asking you to pray about it, think about it, and uh, commit uh, by prayer and by the grace of God that you can give to help these missionaries make it to the field. And I know God will bless you for that. I've seen it personally in my own life, and uh, let's just do our part. So get those turned in tonight in the offering if you can. 
Uh, if not, get it to me by Wednesday night or by Sunday so we can get those things tallied up and then uh, we can see what we're going to do with our missions coming up for the rest of the year. It's going to be great. All right, before we turn it over to Brother Rodney, I'd like to make a presentation to some of our missionaries that we have here today. We have, you know, these missionaries, they travel, they, they go all over the place trying to raise support. And one thing we are so thankful for are the wives of these missionaries. You know, they, they, they follow their husbands. They feel called as well. That I tell folks, listen, you can't go unless your wife is called too. Uh, you can't say, I'm called and she's not. What are you going to do? you you got to be together in this. And it's so it's amazing how you see these women as they follow and uh, their husbands, they support them, they, they hold them up in prayer, constantly, faithfully, and I thank God for these families that are here together with us today. And uh, we want to be a blessing to them. Our ladies got together in our church and put together some baskets uh, for the missionary ladies that are here, and so uh, we'd like to present those at this time. Debbie, come on up, and uh, oh, you grabbed one of those. I was, I was hoping she'd be here for that. Okay. Come on up, sweetie, and uh, we've got uh, the basket. Let's start with Rodney. Uh, he's not a lady, <clears throat> but he has a lady, and she is in Pennsylvania. So uh, we're going to give that to him, and I want to thank you for uh, being here with us. God bless you. We miss Lynn. I'm sure we miss her. We love her. How many remember Lynn, his wife? And she was a member of our church for many years. <laughs> All right. Thank you, brother. And uh, behave, behave yourself. Behave yourself. All right. Next, we've got, uh, let's see, Vipin. Okay. And it was nice to, to meet these guys for the first time, and we're glad that they have been able to be with us, and what a blessing they are. And so here you go. God bless you guys. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Want to be a blessing. And uh, I thank the Lord for our ladies here, too. Their heart for missions is uh, amazing. So thank you, ladies, for putting this together. And then uh, Annika as well, Mislin, got something for you. God bless you. Thank you for being part of our missions conference. Oh, you're welcome. God bless you. All right, Rodney, it's your turn. You can put that down. Quit messing with it. Rodney's going to give a presentation about the Congo, and then after that, we'll take up an offering. Thank you. Two years ago, while we were still in Tanzania, uh, we had already seen the Lord do, do some magnificent things in order to free us up from the ministry that was there so that we can refocus on the ministry God was calling us to coming back to the United States. But while we were still there, uh, because of other African countries being uh, easily traveled to from Tanzania, I set out with uh, either one or, my, or another one of my sons in order to do some surveys in different areas of different countries that were close to Tanzania for the purpose of discovering the Lord's will concerning new works in unreached areas, difficult reached areas, or misreached areas. And so uh, my son and, uh, and myself, Sean, went to Uganda, visited one of our missionaries there, and then that missionary was to go with us across the border into eastern Congo, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And my son had been secretly praying that God would uh, verify in his heart whether he was calling him to be a missionary to the Congo or not. And so he didn't share any of the, of the request with anyone, not even to myself, but while he prayed for that, a couple of things that he prayed for was that miraculously God would allow us to meet and visit the reclusive Wabambuti uh, tribe that lives in the rainforest in the Congo. Now, uh, the Wabambuti only grow to be about so tall, uh, adult males, and so they're a very small people, a little bit taller sometimes but certainly not uh, uh, full-size people. And it, they're very reclusive. They're not very, uh, they're very open, very difficult to meet them. But the missionary that was going to go with us into the Congo was held up at the border. They, they refused to let him into the country. So he gave us his truck, and he called at the last second one of his pastors that he'd been training in Uganda, but he is Congolese on the other side of the border. And he said, Pastor, will you go with James? I think you might have a relative or something in Bunia where he's going. He's like, yeah, yeah, I have a relative. So, okay. 
He goes with us, never met the man before, but we get to Bunia in the Congo, and while we're there, he's looking for his relative, and he can't find him, finds out that he's farther in country, another uh, 20 uh, plus kilometers or so, in uh, right next to the, uh, to the rainforest where he has um, uh, farms and the uh, village of uh, Komanda. So we, the next day we drove out to Komanda looking for him and we found him just, it was just uh, on the street and uh, we were located him. He's like, well, I'm in a pastor's meeting of a different denomination and uh, why don't you come and just introduce yourself, say hi to everyone. So we went to that meeting and in that meeting, like, hi, my name is Pastor James, Pastor Rodney, and I'm really glad to meet you. I'm from Tanzania. Uh, well, I'm from America, work in Tanzania. Um, and then uh, my son introduced himself and told them about his desire to maybe, if the Lord brought him back, to work with the Wambambuthi or someone like that. And then they kept going around introducing themselves. About the fifth person around, the evangelist stands up and says, um, says, hey, I'm evangelist so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, for the last year I've been working with the Wabambuti, and uh, after this is over, if you guys want to go and meet them, then uh, let me know. And Sean looks at me, and he's like, yeah, can we go, can we go? And I'm like, oh, son, I don't know. I mean, it's already getting late in the day, and we do not want to be out on these uh, Congolese roads after dark, and getting back, it's going to take me, it's all the head, they all run away because they're, they're, they run away and hide. You know, their dishes are sitting out there. They're cooking a meal, but there's no one to be found. Uh, so you know that they were there like 10 seconds earlier. Um, go to the second one, no one. Go to the third one, and we were able to meet with a whole group of them and uh, share with them the uh, Bible study and, and everything. When I got back, we got back to our room where we were staying that night. My son, Sean, tells me, he said, well, the Lord just clarified for me his calling to be church planting missionary to the Congo. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he told me all of the things that just happened in the last couple of days that he hadn't told anyone else, but God had called him to go there by verifying it, by answering very specific prayer requests that he didn't share with anyone else just because he wanted to know and just because God does things like that. And so we praise the Lord for that. So a lot of the pictures you're going to see today is about um, some pictures that we took while we were there. Sean is the one who put this video together, and it shows a little bit of the... Uh, where, what the Congo is, what they've gone through, their history, and then uh, ending with what we can do in order to bind together in prayer for the unreached and the, uh, the unwanted in many ways there in the Congo. So thank you for watching.
He is a sophomore and already doing this type of presentation to get there. So uh, pretty neat. Okay. Missionary in Tanzania, Aaron Scheidt. Powerful stuff here. How many remember Sean? And a good, good young man. And uh, neat to see what God's doing. Let's have our ushers come forward. We're going to take up the offering at this time. And again, our last opportunity to give for this missions conference. And again, encourage these guys along the way. We did hear some good news. Uh, Brother JB has a, another meeting lined up and got another supporting church today. And so praise the Lord for that. We want to continue to see that happen for our brother as well as these other guys, too. They're all on deputation right now, trying to raise their funds to go. Uh, Brother Mislin, you said the fall of this year, you're hoping to get there, Lord willing. And then Brother Vipin, what did you say also? Somewhere like the fall, you're trying to get over there. And so, uh, and so this is a, a big challenge, but God can do it. So let's pray for these guys, give them a good love offering, and send them on their way, okay? All right, and uh, let's see, Brother Ron, you want to pray for us? We'll dedicate the offering to the Lord. for us, and uh, good to have you preach again. Come on. You're going to sing first. You're going to sing first. Okay. So this song is an adaptation of Bury my heart on the mission field, Lord. Uh, I spoke to the uh, mother of the, uh, the lady who wrote that song, who is a member of one of our supporting churches in Oklahoma, and told her what I wanted to do with the lyrics because I knew that her daughter had written the lyrics uh, mostly based on the idea of her experiences that she saw when she was on the mission field. And I told her, Mom, I said, I want to do the same thing. Uh, just take these uh, first couple of verses and uh, change them to more reflect the experiences that I had while I was on the mission field as far as what I saw with people and with evangelizing and she was, she was good with that. So if you recognize the tune but not the words, then that would be the reason why. A mother tries to burn her way to God. She struggles to raise her family. 
striving to please a religion that's a fraud, thinking shaken by eternity. Send me to preach the living word of God, so captives might be set at liberty. I'll carry my burden to dark and dying lands. Lord, please open their hearts. A young boy is watching his father every day, learning his sinful, evil ways, drinking and lying. You want me to preach now? Thank you. Revelation chapter 3, if you would please turn there. The video you watched just a few minutes ago had a uh, reference to the 1994 genocide that took place in the small country of Rwanda, a time in history where two tribes, the Watutsi and the Hutu, were struggling to find out who was going to be in power, and the one took up uh, machetes and mallets and malice, and within a hundred days slew about a million people of the other tribe for the purpose of extermination. Many of the tribe was able to uh, understand what was going on quick enough in order to gather whatever they could on their backs and their arms and just try to get to the, to the next country, to the Congo mostly, to Uganda, and even to Tanzania. But there were also those that knew what would happen, and so they placed people with machetes and other uh, uh, weapons in, uh, off of the road so that when caravans would come by, they could just jump out and start whacking away at people and slaughtering people on the road. Well, this is something that had just happened on one particular road that led out to the Congo, and there were people laying on either sides of the road in the ditches, and then there was another uh, uh, caravan that come by uh, not too long after that. And in this smaller caravan, there was a young girl around eight years old who noticed it was around midnight 
noticed some, uh, some slight movement off in the ditch on the right-hand side, and there was some whimpering and crying going on. And she went over and she found a baby that was still strapped to the back of her mother who had been killed and left for dead along with many others, but the baby was still alive. Now, the baby was of the wrong tribe. And if she were to be found with that baby, then he, her herself would be slaughtered. But she didn't care. She picked up that baby and she tied it onto her back the way that African mothers uh, usually carry their babies with a, uh, with a conga, a sheet, and wrapped it around and tied it to the front. And she began to carry that baby on her back for the, uh, throughout the rest of the night. Now, many of the other people in her own tribe saw what she did and scolded her, told her, you put that baby down right now where you are. You're putting us all in danger. There could be another ambush up ahead, and that ambush come out and, and go through each one of us and see that you have that baby from, from that tribe and, and kill, kill the baby, kill you, and kill the rest of us. But she wouldn't do it. She held on to that baby, and she got that caravan and that baby and that girl all the way into the Congo, and that baby lived. She didn't know her name or where she came from or what she was all about, but she gave her the name Naima, which is the Swahili word for grace. Grace is what describes what happened to that child who was left for dead in a ditch, but there was a young girl who came and rescued her out of no, uh, uh, no merits of her own, picked her up and saved her and gave her life back to her. Grace. Grace is what we are looking for from the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is what he has given us. Grace is what empowers and brings the gospel of peace from our land to the other lands, from where we are to where we are going. In Revelation chapter 3, we find a church that is a candlestick. It's a light, a light that is in a place in the city of Philadelphia, and that light is that instrument of grace shining out the gospel of peace, the gospel of grace to all of those who will hear and understand its influence and respond with stepping up and offering themselves to God in salvation. Let's take a moment to pause and pray and then move into our text for tonight. Heavenly Father, we pray that the grace that you have given to us freely and fully, saving us from who we were, sinners, wretched, selfish, ambitious in our own right, looking to care for, for, for ourselves before anyone and anything, but yet your Son, Jesus Christ, who you sent to the cross to die in our place and gave us that grace that we needed for salvation. Now that we have that, you have also given us a wonderful and mighty privilege of reconciling the word of reconciliation, going before a world and bringing that grace to others that they might experience the salvation that we have fully and freely accepted in the name of Christ. Father, I pray that tonight you will show us grace. You will give us your word. You will challenge us in, your, in our hearts and that we would leave here tonight knowing that we have left every bit of ourselves here to be buried and we will go out with every bit of you being our guide and our Lord in helping us to be conformed to your image that your grace might be seen through us and through our influence in the sphere of our life, others would find your grace. We pray and we ask for your blessing at this time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I told a part of this story last year when I was here concerning my time in Tanzania where I was in a restaurant and there was a uh, there was a tourist there who was taking pictures of, uh, of soldiers as they marched by outside, and the soldiers came in and confronted him, and 
I jumped up and ran over and put myself in between them because he knows English and how I went getting one of Swahili, how these others know Swahili, and uh, I know both, and I thought that I could be a help, but then I turned to the soldiers, and then I realized, oh, that was the wrong uh, position, and I put my hands up, and he punched me, and he kicked me uh, in the, uh, you don't kick with your hand, he kicked me in the, in the gut, and I was oh, hunched over. And uh, the tourist ran outside looking for his phone that they had taken and they had passed outside. And uh, they grabbed him and they threw him down on the sidewalk. And I threw the soldiers aside. However, that happened, I don't know, but it happened. And I ran outside to the sidewalk and I started raising a ruckus. And instead of stomping the guy uh, on the sidewalk, they picked him up and put him in the middle of their, uh, of their band of soldiers and began to march him down the street, which I knew was a typical thing that would happen if they were going to take him off to a, to a side room or, or the back alley and, and beat him to death until he promised to give him everything uh, that he had. Uh, but I just was raising a ruckus and make sure that that didn't happen. And they turned the corner and headed down this direction in an area that was, I knew that there was a, uh, a headquarters of theirs down there. And so I had been following along on the sidewalk. And so I stopped on the sidewalk. And just a few seconds later, that tourist in the middle of those soldiers looked over his shoulder at me and he said, please don't leave me. And my first thought was, oh, brother. And then my second thought was this, you know, because I'm such a spiritual missionary there. Haven't I done enough? Haven't I done enough? Really, that was my, that was my thinking. I wanted to get out. I wanted to stop. This is not where I wanted to be. It's not what I planned for the day. And you know, really, a lot of us come to a point in our lives, our Christian lives, where we're going along, we've made some hard but right decisions, and we get to a point in our life where we just simply stop and we think to ourselves, haven't I done enough? Isn't this going far enough? And we're contemplating being satisfied and content with the degree of obedience and sacrifice that we have finally reached. And we ask ourselves, haven't we gone enough? Haven't we gone far enough? But yet, whether we can hear it or we cannot hear it, there is coming a voice like a Macedonian call throughout the world who is looking to the church and saying, please don't leave me. Please don't leave me. And we're asking ourselves, haven't we done enough when we should be asking ourselves, not haven't we done enough, but what more can I do? I don't know where this is going to lead me, I thought to myself. But I put myself out right in the middle of those soldiers, stood right next to that man, and I said, don't worry, Wherever you go, I'm going to go too. And I didn't know where that was going to be and how it was going to end. And I ended well, praise the Lord, because I'm still here, not locked up in a Tanzanian prison somewhere, being starved to death. Uh, But neither was he, so praise the Lord for that. But the idea is this young lady who went and took that baby up, she wasn't asking herself, haven't I done enough? When I was on that sidewalk asking myself, I came to the conclusion, listen, right is always right. And because it's right, then it's worth doing, not knowing what's going to happen, because Christ is in control. In Revelation chapter 3, we have, a, we have a church. That church is a candlestick in a place in the world where Christ had placed it because he built his church, and he comes to this church through the apostle John, And he tells John to write these seven letters to seven different literal local churches in Asia Minor to make sure they get this message to them through him. And this church in Philadelphia, he writes these words, one of only two of the seven churches, which has no condemnation to it. There's nothing bad that Christ had to say to this church in Philadelphia. And we read in verse number seven of chapter three these words, that, that tell us of the church's heavenly authority. The church's heavenly authority. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, 
he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. It says here, he that is holy, that is he knows who is serving him in righteousness, and he knows who is serving him in self-righteousness. Christ is called the one who is true. He knows who is propagating the truth of the gospel and who is propagating error. True to his message, Jesus Christ is, but he's also true in his intentions and he's true in his motives. Number three is that he that hath the key of David. Christ has world-dominating authority, both in his nation of Israel, but in all nations throughout the world. It says here, he that openeth. He that openeth, that is the door. It's not just an authority of oversight that Christ has, but it's, an, it's, it's a hands-on, active a role that he plays in, number one, the world of men, number two, the church, and number three, the ministry of reconciling the world to himself. Christ is in sovereign control. What was the church created for? Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Thus the open door is to teach all nations all that Christ has commanded. And that is to make go and you as disciples go and make disciples. Teach all nations. Make disciples. Build my church. That is according to the church's heavenly authority, not its own ability. Secondly, we find in verse number 8, the church's heartfelt activity. First, we saw the church's heavenly authority. But secondly, here we see the church's heartfelt activity. Verse number 8, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. Past tense, I've already done it. It's in place. I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Their works, which Christ knew, number one, was keeping his word. I believe this speaks of the final word that Christ gave to the church that really it defines who the church is. The church is the, the church's directive, that great commission. It's heart and habit of its church's members. It's purpose and plan of the church's ministry. It's the core and commitment of the church's motivation, the church's directive, the great commission. The word which was kept was their commitment to go and make disciples. So when you see here Christ saying, for thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word. What does that tell you? You have a little strength, but you've kept my word. You have a little strength, but that directive that I gave you, that little strength that you have that did not stop you, stifle you, or keep you from keeping my word. That word of evangelism, that word of being disciples and making disciples. And right there, that tells you being weak, being little, but able to fulfill all of Christ's will and command without any issue because it's a spiritual work. It's a spiritual work. And that's why he commended them by saying, you are little, but you've kept my word. Secondly, their work of which Christ knew was that they had not denied his name. You have not denied my name. That speaks of the courageous witness that they needed to be while keeping his word. They endured persecution which came and tries us and tried them as they are spreading the word of God. God set before the Philadelphia church an open door of missions outreach. The city of Philadelphia 
was on the main route between first century Europe and Asia. People from all nations came either to or through that city for commerce, trade, and business. It was a wicked city, but it was the perfect place for God to place an open door. It was the perfect place for God to plant his candlestick. And at that candlestick, shining the light of the grace of the gospel of Christ, a door was open for ministry that God had opened himself. An open door, he did that for three reasons. Number one, it tells us because they were weak. It says, for thou hast a little strength. A little strength. What does that mean? Well, number one, it's talking about their insignificance in number. They couldn't be a large church. They didn't have a lot of people. Number two, I believe it's also referring to their resources. You don't have a lot of people. These people are different. They are in a place where uh, uh, most of the commerce is from people coming in and out and through. They are doing their best to make ends meet. They don't have a lot of resources, but number three, they were little in strength as far as recognition was concerned. The, uh, uh, the society, the place, Philadelphia, they weren't, their name as a church was not known. They were not making huge impact in societal change or governmental change or, or, or anything like that. They had a little strength because they were little in number, little in resources, little in recognition. We know they were strong, though, spiritually, because Christ commended them and did not rebuke them. But it was with this weakness, with this lack of strength, they were still able to keep Christ's word. It must speak of the church as a whole because of this letter to the church as a whole. The command was to preach and to teach and to go and to witness, and in doing so, Thy word is kept. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then in doing that, they did not deny his name. They did not alter his name to become more acceptable among the varieties of nations and people groups and religions, etc. In the face of certain rejection, persecution, tribulation, ostracization, and more, they stayed loyal to the name of Christ. Peter said in Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Luke 14.26 says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Hating the name of of your family in preference to the name of Christ caused these disciples to be ostracized from the rest of their families who did not receive Christ so that they had to rely only on each other for protection and provision. For protection and provision and for personal relationships. But they did it. And they kept his name. And they preached the word. We saw the church's heavenly authority. That's Christ himself. We considered the church's heartfelt activity. That's just two things. In their weakness, they were strong to keep his word. And to not deny his name. And thirdly, we see the church's hopeful eternity. Verse 11, Behold, Jesus told them, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Crowns are not to be given primarily as a show of dignity and hierarchy, but to place those faithful sons into roles of service in Christ's future kingdom. That's why we see in the scriptures talking about the rewards that are laid up for those who are faithful, the rewards of crowns and thrones and robes. All of these things are references to places in which we can be placed with responsibility and authority in his kingdom in order to have purpose 
and a place of service to the one who has given us grace all through our life, and we have served him. Here we see three things uh, that we can take from verse number 11. Number one, there is a finality for you. If you could imagine this church in a strange place, weak, insignificant, but they're doing two things, and their life is centered around those two things. Man, we are going to evangelize. We are going to disciple. We have an open door that's been placed here by Christ himself. By no effort or strength of ourselves were we able to place it or open it or even close it, but it's here in front of us. And because we recognize that God, through his sovereign design, has placed it here before us, us, right here in this place, we are going to do it. Because we are convinced that in our weakness, he's made strong. We are convinced that in, his, that, 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 that in our sorriness, he is sovereign. And if that is true, and here we are, what can we not do? What can we not do? And the point is this. If they're not asking themselves, haven't I done enough? They were asking themselves, what more can I do? In my weakness, what more can I do? In my lackness, what more can I do? To show him strong on our behalf. And under that pressure of rejection, Under that pressure of ostracization, they were faithful to the gospel and they bore the scars of it. But Christ is telling them in verse number 11, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. He was telling them, number one, there is a finality to this. It's not up to you to decide when it's time to quit. It's up to me to determine when it's time for you to graduate. Secondly, there is a future for you. Christ speaks here of a crown to be worn as well as a position in his temple and in his city. Listen, there's a finality to this, but beyond that, there's a future for you when this is all over. And then number three, right here and right now, there's a family for you. There's a family for you. Christ speaks to this Philadelphia church as a family, as a whole, as a unit, and even speaks of the winning of the one reward as one crown. What does he say here? He's talking to Philadelphia. He's talking to the church. He's talking to them as thou and thee as one body. And he says that no man take, was he talking to the pastor? Thy crown, was he talking to each person individually? You know, to one degree probably. But in this verse, what does he do? He corporately places them together. And he says, hey, you've kept my word. Hey, you've not denied my name. Hey, I've got a crown for you. Now, if, if this was written in the South, it would say, for all y'all. If it was written in the North, it would say, Ewans. But here it's talking about that one church. And I believe that this is just another reference which Christ gives about the family, the unit, the body, the unification of the local church referenced as the candlestick in Philadelphia. This is your family. And it's with this family in this place that you have relied on each other, that God has shown himself strong on your behalf to keep you, to use you right here at this open door. Remember, The church's heavenly authority is Christ himself. It's he that is holy and true and sets the doors to be opened and closed. The church's heartfelt activity, that is the work of of missions, the work of making disciples, 
when you yourself are a disciple, as well as remaining faithful and steadfast and true in that work, though there be persecution and rejection. And then the church's hopeful, uh, hopeful eternity is that there's a finality and there's a future, but right here is your family. I come quickly, hold to that which is fast. Hold, hold. Now my kids aren't here, so I can't grab one of them up and use them as an illustration. So this is gonna be a substitute. All right, hold. As I would do to my son or my daughter. Remember being in a pressing crowd, hundreds of people pushing and pressing all around me uh, in, in an airport in, uh, in, in, in Tebe. And I had, I believe it was Jameson in my arms. And I just, I would hold him. He felt, he felt insecure of what was going on. I held him. I remember uh, being on a subway in, uh, in Paris just a year ago. And my son, Sean, of course, he's much older, but there were all kinds of people and languages, and it was nighttime, and we were standing there in the door, and all of a sudden this wave of people from behind us just carried us into the, into the subway car, whether we wanted to or not, and we were just pressed like this. And I grabbed the back of my pocket like this because of the contents there. And I held it fast. And I didn't let go until things were over. Now, a wallet is not a child. A wallet is not something that you're overly concerned about as much as you are the life of your child or the life of your, your wife. But just imagine that thing that matters to you the most. And you are holding on to that thing for, for, for his life, for her life for all that you love and hold dear. Christ tells his church right here, behold, don't give up. Behold, I come quickly. Behold, hold that fast which thou hast. He's not talking about holding on to a crown and a future reward, although that would be earned. He's talking about holding on to that which is important, that which matters in this world. And that is the lost that have yet heard the word of Christ. That they might have that grace. That they might sense how Christ came and picked them up out of nothing. Strapped them to his back and were carried to Calvary. And they're saved by the precious blood of Christ. The church's hopeful eternity is something that we have because we have eternal life. But there's a world that has eternal death. And here's the church being admonished. Hold, hold, hold that fast which thou hast. What do they have? Are they holding on eternal life so it doesn't slip away? Are they holding on to a crown so it doesn't slip away? Hold on to that work that you are doing. The preaching of the gospel for as far as your influence goes, keeping that word. And number two, keeping my name. Keeping my name. Heavenly Father, tonight, we come to the last minutes and seconds of a conference that we have been a part of. The effort, the thrust, the motivation was to revive our hearts, to allow you to move in us and through us, to teach us to trust in you in a way that we cannot do ourselves, to give our hearts to you that you might correct us, that you might fill us, and that you might set the priorities of our life on eternity instead of self. That you might teach us to pray that you might show us what is important in this world 
in what is not as important. But Father, we confess to you that we have little strength. Help us then not to trust in ourselves but instead to trust in what you want to do and what you are doing in us and through us, that which we cannot do ourselves, And that is the work of missions and enduring steadfast in the work of missions. Father, I pray that you help us tonight as we finish to focus on eternity to be grateful for you helping us to do that activity while relying on your heavenly authority. This church is your candlestick. Let your light so shine in it and through it that all may see your good works and glorify your Father. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your patience. We thank you for your compassion. We thank you that you are long-suffering towards us. I pray that you strengthen, establish, make useful, and, and, and make this church into exactly what you want it to be for this coming year and for the duration of their time here. We thank you for your, all that you've done, and we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Before we have our invitation, I want to just challenge you here this evening. Two things came to my mind as Brother Rodney was closing and preaching. And two things to think about. Our theme verse, the Lord Jesus said that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. What is the difference between Cross and Crown Baptist Church church right here and the church in Manila. What is the difference between our church right here and the churches that are in Uzbekistan? What is the difference between our church and the church in Tanzania that Rodney was able to start? Did you know really there's no difference? Those people that are there are a people that were saved by the grace of God like we are saved by the grace of God. Amen? They have an organization. They have a building. They meet together. They study the Word of God. They have the burden of the Word on them to reach the lost in their community. And yet here we are in America, in Cantonment, in the greater Pensacola area, and we look at ourselves as the church in the states, sending missionaries to reach the world. I want you to get that out of your head. One thing that God really impressed upon my heart tonight is Rodney's application of the candlestick. That God has a candlestick in Manila, a candlestick in Uganda or Tanzania or in Uzbekistan. He's got a candlestick in Cusco, and we all understand that, those missionaries there, and they need to report, they need to win souls, they need to be on fire, those are those missionaries, but guys, listen, in the mind of God, there's a candlestick right here. We are the same. Our church should be just as missions-minded, our church should be just as soul-conscious and evangelistic as any church that is around the world. We see the slides, we see the programs, and we think to ourselves, well, they're doing it, and we're the church in the States. Listen, I don't think God looks at it that way. He looks at our church and says, what are you doing? What are you doing? The vision that I would like you to have in your mind is that we have a candlestick right here in Cantonment in the greater Pensacola area, and God expects us to shine, to hold forth the word of God, and when people to Jesus Christ. We are of little strength, brother. We're a small church. We don't have a lot of resources, but by God's grace, we will hold fast and we will accomplish what he's told us to do. Can you get a vision crossing crown?
Can you get a vision for what God could do with our church right here in the Pensacola area? Not only to, to send missionaries like we've done in the past, but to really reach this community like never before. What a revival that could be if you could catch that vision. And this is what I'd like us to do tonight. Let's all stand, shall we, with our heads bowed and eyes closed. I'd like you just to pray a prayer of dedication for yourself and thinking about your family and thinking about this church. You know, Rodney mentioned at the very end there how the church, the crown, was given to the church corporately. Think about that. Our church corporately, who we are as a church body. We are important to stay together to serve God together, to win souls together, to reach the kids with our bus ministry and teenagers and all around us working together. That unity that he wants us to have and that we were given that crown. Well, what a vision to have, cross and crown. Let's think through that, dedicate ourselves and our heart anew and afresh, not only to, to missions and reaching the lost around the world, but to evangelizing the greater Pensacola area as well. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we stand before you as a church body tonight. I, I realize we have many visitors, but as a church body here in this area, we can see scripturally, Father, that you have given us a candlestick, an open door that you have opened and no man can shut. And there is an open door here, just as much as there's an open door in Manila, there's an open door here in Cantonment and Milton and Molino and Pace and Pensacola. There's an open door here, just as much as there's an open door in Central Asia, in the Congo. Father, you have opened these doors. You have placed Cross and Crown Baptist Church as a candlestick right here. God, unify our heart, revive us to realize who we are as a corporate body, as a church, to be able to unify and to strive together for the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ right here. And then to pull together with our prayers and with our preaching and with our, our resources, our provision, to send forth missionaries all around the world. Give us a vision, Father. Revive our hearts for this. And we'll thank you for what you can do and what you will do. And we stand here dedicating to you, Lord, our hearts. Once again, anew and afresh as a church body. Bless us, Lord, as we serve you. Give us a vision for what you can do with us as we serve you with all of our heart. And we'll thank you, Father. Bless these dear families that have come to share their burden, to pray with us every night to hear the preaching, to present, to share. Thank you for Rodney. Lord, all of the things that were done this week has been for your honor and glory. I believe that. And you have moved in our hearts. And so, God, thank you for meeting with us and challenging us. And now, Lord, help us take what we've heard, apply it, and use it, and empower us, Father, as a church. And we'll thank you for what you're going to do. Bless our evening as we depart. Please keep us safe. All of these men and women as they travel to new churches, raising support, please bless them, Lord. And God, will thank you for what you're going to do here at Cross and Crown with a new vision and excitement for what you can do in this area. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. And listen, you're, you're welcome to